A student came to me a while back after Psych 1 was over, and she said, Professor Friddle, and I have a kind of a weird question to ask you. She said, when I'm on Tinder, and I'm swiping on all these people, I make these faces. I make these yuck faces, I make these blah faces, I make these smiles, and I'm all alone by myself in my room, me and my app, and here I am making these goofy faces. She says, why am I making these faces? Is there something wrong with me? Well, the first thing I had to tell her was that there was nothing wrong with her. We all make faces when we're alone. And in fact, the fact that we make faces when we're alone turns out to be one of the most interesting and decisive questions in the whole field of facial expressions, which is something I've been studying for about, oh, 142 years. So what I hope to do is to lead you on a little journey today into an explanation as to why we make faces when you're alone, when we're alone. And the journey starts here, when we're born. When we're born, we look at our mommy and our mommy looks back at, uh, at us and she's in focus, which is a miracle of sorts because our visual systems are wired such that, well, we're not good at focusing on things when we're born. We're only good at seeing things about eight to 10 inches away, which is about the distance that mommy holds our head such that our face is eight to 10 inches from her face. She looks at us, we look at her, she smiles at us. It'll be a while before we can return that smile. Pretty soon, by about six to eight weeks, we're starting to use our faces. We start to cry and make cry faces toward our caretakers, and we find that they respond to us. They find what needs fixing and they fix it. Pretty soon we learn that they come by when they see a cry face and they don't even wait for us to start crying. In fact, they come when they see a cry face before we start crying so that they don't have to hear us cry. We also, by about eight weeks, start to make a smile. Oftentimes with a little bit of a giggle. And they come running because we find with that smile we can hook them into playing with us as long as we want to stay awake. And this is the beginning of bonding. You know, our bonding with mama was the most important social bond we'll ever have in our lives. Now, when we broadcast these kinds of faces, we can bring all kinds of other people, family, even the family pets into our social sphere we also begin to use our faces to recruit other people into helping us solve our problems and resolve our conflicts. We start to see this about 10 or 11 months in a gadget called, a contraption called a visual cliff. This is a contraption that has a glass floor with a drop off about halfway across so that the infant who goes across the floor has to, faces a choice point. Do I stay back or do I crawl along the glass floor even though there's a drop off? Well, we find something odd that happens. If mommy's at the other end, what she does affects whether the infant chooses to hold back or proceed. And here we see an infant, that face that infant makes says, I need data. Mommy smiles. If, she, if the infant sees mommy smiles, guess what happens? The baby proceeds and goes off to conquer the world. But if baby says, I need data, and mommy frowns, guess what happens? Baby holds back. Now this process is called social referencing. And it's not a process that's confined to infancy. We use this process the rest of our lives. Whenever we face a situation that's ambiguous, 
our instinct is immediately to turn to other people to say, how am I supposed to understand what's going on? It's the means by which we build our consensual reality, and it's the means by which we form community values. Now, a funny thing happens by the time we reach preschool. We've got this repertoire by which we signal other people, they signal back to us when we develop a social interchange, mutual reciprocal signaling. But by the time we hit preschool, we're likely to see a poster like this on the walls. How many of you remember a poster like this when you went to school? Raise your hand. You know, the poster, this poster says there are certain faces that we make and there are certain feelings that go with these faces. Now it's kind of odd that we have to be taught this. Our teacher goes through this and says, now this is a happy face and you make this face when you feel happy. Chances are we never thought about the faces we were making. We got along just fine without all this formal education. Why, the, why all the pedagogy on this? And where did it come from? Well, it turns out that there were studies in the 1960s in which people got together and said, well, you know, we think there are about six universal emotions across cultures, and we think there are about six faces that go with these emotions, so we're gonna test our theory. So we're gonna take these emotions and we're gonna take these faces, go all over cultures. We're gonna take familiar cultures, we're gonna take remote cultures. And we're gonna see if people can match the faces to the emotions. And when you look across cultures, they can do it a little better than chance. So guess what? The faces confirm the emotions, the emotions confirm the faces, and look, we got faces fitting into boxes. And that's the basis for these posters. But that's a kind of a circular logic, isn't it? For example, if, if I'm an ancient Greek, or I believe like the ancient Greeks did, I could say, there are four elements in nature, earth, air, fire, and water, and now here are four catastrophes. I'm gonna ask you to match the catastrophe with the element. I'm guessing I could go to almost any culture on the planet and you'd be able to match the catastrophe to the element. The catastrophe that expresses the element. Probably most of you would be able to match fire to volcanoes and so forth. But does this tell us anything about the nature of the world? And do those studies that put faces into boxes tell us anything about how we use our faces in everyday life? Well, if we just take this study right here, uh, I can tell you that it Last count, there were 118 elements, not four. And let's just go abracadabra, there are now 14 more natural catastrophes, not four. So these kinds of experiments where you simply match lists don't tell you much about how people use, how people, what kinds of catastrophes are, uh, exist in the world, how many elements there are, or how people use their faces in the world. In fact, uh, Despite that, this view of faces in boxes is true, or at least is being taught all over the world. Here are faces uh, as depicted in boxes from France, Spain, and Hong Kong. My claim and what I hope to lead you to is the idea that, or the realization that we use our faces much more subtly, and that we use our faces in the context of whom we're, whom we're interacting with and what the context is of the interaction. Let's take this person right here. This is a person from Papua New Guinea. This was one of the exotic locales that these cross-cultural studies were performed in. Now, let's just say that uh, I'm the woman, and you ask me, do I have a stomach ache? And you're my sister. I'm going to make one kind of face to you. But if you're a complete stranger who asks me, do I have a stomach ache? I'm gonna make a very different kind of face to you. We pick the people and the moment to make the kinds of faces we make. In fact, the faces I make to you aren't about me, they're about you. We pick our faces depending on who you are and why you want to know. So for example, um, if, uh, uh, 
There are studies that show, for example, take bowlers. Bowlers, when they make a strike, they don't smile when they make a strike. They wait until they turn around and greet the others in their bowling party, and then they make a, a, their smile. It's as though their smile says, look what I just did. At the Olympics, Olympians, when they receive their gold medals, they don't smile when they receive their medals, the, the moment of greatest happiness, if you will. They smile when they turn around and meet their fellow, and meet the gaze of their fellow athletes. It's almost like they're sharing their happiness or they're bringing home their triumph to their clan. Now, let's go back to our Papua New Guinea woman. Okay, you're my sister, and you ask me about my tummy ache. I may make a face that says to you, I'm suffering so much with my tummy, sister. It's a face that maybe reaches out for support. It's a face that says, uh, I've suffered so much. If you're a complete stranger who asks me about my tummy ache, I'm likely to make a face that says, my tummy is none of your business. And, and so our faces are ways that, that I influence you. When I, when I make a face to my sister, that face is a way of recruiting empathy, a way of recruiting sucker. Maybe it's a way of saying, sister, I really could use your support. I really could use a hug. I really could you, use you to call the doctor for me. Maybe go get some medicine for me. All that is part of my presentation to my sister. If I'm saying it to a stranger, it could be a way of saying, don't go there anymore. Just get out of here. No more questions about my tummy. No more questions about anything. You're not welcome in my house. It's a way of deterring interaction. So it's the function to my faces, the faces I make to you. Now what happens when we're alone? Well, there's a clue from the, the social critic H.L. Mencken, who said, conscience is that inner voice that tells us someone might be watching. We always play to an imaginary audience. I think. Shakespeare said, all the world's a stage. And I think in our heads, we're, we always have someone else in mind. The, the first thing we do when we take ourselves off the social grid, the first thing we do when we go private, when we want a few minutes to ourselves, is we, bing, we begin to repopulate our social world with imaginary others. We begin to turn our surroundings into a social web, whether it's in our head or in the objects that surround us. And here are some of the ways we do it. We act as if others are present when they're not. For example, when I watch TV, I, when we're watching a sports game, we cheer, we yell, we make faces at our favorite sports team. Now our sports team isn't there. Our sports team is just simply luminescent dots on an LED glass panel. That team cannot hear us, and yet there we are. Go team! Go team! When we're watching political debates, we may want to yell at certain candidates. We, we may want to cheer certain candidates. For that matter, we may want to throw things at the screen at other candidates. We treat them as though they're there. When we talk on the phone, we make faces at the people on the other end of the line. They're not in the room. They can't see us. But out come the faces. Victims cry out, is anybody there? Because they, we think there may be nobody there, but we hope that maybe there would be somebody there. 
We imagine that others are present when they're not. When I was writing this talk, I imagined that you all were there in my head. And I imagined making faces to you, and I imagined you making faces back to me. We forecast interaction and we make the appropriate faces. When we hear good news or when we hear bad news, we can't help but think, whom am I going to tell this news to? We run through the simulations of who are the first people I'm going to tell and how is it going to go with each one. We treat non-humans and inanimate objects in, in, inanimate objects as social beings. You know, we take our pets and we have full conversations with them. We give them names. We make faces. Even if our pets are goldfish, we, we take our inanimate objects. People have total conversations with their house plants. They talk about what a terrible day it is as they polish the leaves of their plants. They talk to stuffed animals, give their stuffed animals a name, caress their stuffed animals. They scold their computers for rebooting in the middle of an important document. And then they turn best friends, they, they turn Siri into their best friend. Okay? And finally, we treat ourselves as interactants. We leave ourselves notes. We encourage ourselves. We scold ourselves. We encourage ourselves. We do unto ourselves as we do unto others. So now you can guess the punchline. Well, you can guess what the, the denouement is with regard to my student on Tinder. Why is she making faces when she's all alone in her dorm room on Tinder? Well, there are some possibilities. We had to check them out. One is she's making faces to the faces on the app. Another is she was imagining going out on dates with each one of them as she swiped left and went, uh. Or she smiled and went, uh. Another might be that she was telling herself, hmm, good choice, not good choice, whatever. But that wasn't any of them. You see, what she was thinking of was her best friend. Because her best friend had kind of been warning her not to go on Tinder in the first place. And she was worried because, well, she hadn't made great choices in the past on Tinder. So she, with each face that she was looking at, she was asking herself in her head, would my best friend approve of each guy? And in fact, she told me she wasn't even sure she'd be asking me about Tinder since her best friend told her to get off of Tinder in the first place and now she was asking me, her professor, about Tinder and this best friend was also in the class. So you see, in those office hours after Psych 1, there were actually three people in the room. There was this student, there was me, and then there was the best friend and I could only see two of them, okay? So now is the punchline, why do we make faces when we're alone? And the answer, as you can probably guess now, is because we are never really alone. Thank you very much.